I'm checking and testing, checking, testing, checking, testing, checking, testing. Hi, this is Michelle with Life After Choice. We'll take it in small bites. Today we're going to be talking about the Feast of Dedication, more commonly known as Hanukkah. Hanukkah is a word that means dedication or consecration, initiation, and it's all about how a temple that was defiled was rededicated back to the service of God. That's what our teaching is going to be about today in honor of this year's Hanukkah. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus, the Word, was with God, but we also read from Isaiah's prophecy about the virgin birth of the Messiah who was to come, who would be called Emmanuel, that he is with us as well, because the name Emmanuel means God with us. This quality of God being with humanity is one of the most important, impactful qualities that touches our lives on a daily basis. God is truly with us. Those of us who've had abortions, we're keenly aware of how our sin has shut the door for God's presence. We know what it's like to feel that God is far away from us and that we can't be reached because of our sin. But the fact is that Everyone has sinned, and the sin of abortion is not the only sin in the world. There, there are lots of sins, and everyone has sinned. So every human being is suffering from the same failure of humanity. And the good news, and the reason that I share this teaching on Hanukkah, is that God has made a way. He's made a sacred place for us, a meeting place where we can touch Him and be with Him and be dedicated ourselves in spite of our sin, and that's the good news that we're going to learn about today. The Garden of Eden was God's first temple, where he intended for a man and God to touch and meet. And in fact, he walked in the garden with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. He was with us there, but our failure caused a defilement in that temple, and therefore we were expelled from it because sin can't be in the presence of a holy God. Yet God did not abandon his project of being with humanity. He found other means by which to commune with us. Let's look at the uh, sanctuary in the wilderness. In Exodus 25, 8, we read that God is instructing Moses to tell the children of Israel, let them build a sanctuary for me. For what purpose? That I may dwell among them. The articles in the tabernacle and the priestly garments and the priests themselves, everything had to go through an ornate purification process to be made worthy of service to the Lord. It was consecrated to him and it was dedicated to his service. Now you can think of dedication as being wholehearted commitment and wholehearted giving, consecrating, making sure that you're set apart for a specific service. Here's numbers seven. The leaders offered the dedication offering for the altar when the tabernacle was being completed. And the Lord said to Moses, let them present their offering, one liter each day, for the dedication of the altar. And God was satisfied. And what was the proof of that satisfaction, that he was finding their dedication acceptable? It was that he filled the tabernacle with his presence. And here we read Exodus 40, verses 34 and 35 say, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory, or the presence, of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Let's move on to the temple. Solomon built a temple that would be a holy place, sanctified and dedicated. And when he was done, he prayed a prayer of dedication. He said, the Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick cloud. I have built you a lofty house and a place for your dwelling forever. To which God replied, that's fine. As long as you, he said this verse that you know very well, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. And, and basically he says the prayers that are spoken in this place will come before my ears. 
But he said, if there's a defilement of this sacred space where we meet, this house which I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight and I will make it a proverb and a byword among all people. As for this house which was exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? And they will say, because they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers who brought them from the land of Egypt. And they adopted other gods and worshiped them and served them. And that's exactly what Solomon did. He started out strong in life, but boy, he ended on a sour note. The temple was destroyed. The people went into exile. And we even read uh, how, in the book of Daniel, how Belshazzar, the Persian king, defiled the articles that were dedicated to service to the temple. He, he just used them to party and drink wine out of in a very profane way. We read in Ezra and Nehemiah when the exiles went back, there was a rebuilding of Jerusalem, there was a rebuilding of the temple and the altar, and then they dedicated these spaces. Now we have cleaned it out, we've purified it, we've consecrated it for use to the Lord, and now we dedicate it. And we have a, a, a verse here from Ezra. This temple was completed on the third day of the month Adar. It was the sixth year of the reign of King Darius, and the sons of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. Here's where we get to Hanukkah, because during the intertestamental period, the silent years so-called, between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New, there was another event where there was a defilement of the temple. And that was that Hanukkah story that we honor each year. At that time in 165 BC, the rulership of Judea fell to Antiochus Epiphanes, and he was a brutal despot and he hated the Jews and did everything he could to shut down their practices that were commanded by God, such as circumcision of children, studying Torah, keeping Sabbath, keeping kosher, even speaking Hebrew, under pain of death. Antiochus defiled the temple by erecting a statue of Zeus inside the temple, and then to add insult to injury, he sacrificed a pig on the altar. And that was a great defilement that was a tragedy for the Jewish people, and the people rose up in guerrilla warfare. The Maccabees defeated the Syrian army in three years and reclaimed the temple. Of course, I'm giving you a very shortened version of the story. But uh, when they reclaimed it, they cleaned it out, they relit the lamp, and they dedicated it to the Lord again. Rededication, and that's why Hanukkah, the word means dedication, and that's why it's also called the Feast of Dedication. In John 10, and 23, we read, At that time, the Feast of the Dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. But Jesus brings us a new understanding of what the temple means, what the temple is. We learn about this when he's speaking to the woman at the well, and he tells her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem... Even at the temple, he's saying, will you worship the Father? An hour is coming and now is, because he's there, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. This was a new understanding of what the meaning of the temple was. Where is the sacred meeting place? Well, we learned from Paul that the church itself, not the building, but the body of believers, is actually a temple. When we read it in Ephesians 2, he came and preached peace to you who are far away, that means the Gentiles, and peace to those who are near, that means the Jews. For through him, through Jesus, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. And he says that these two people groups have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. See, we're building a building here in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together. You, Jew and Gentile, are being built together as believers in one spirit into a building which is a dwelling of God in the Spirit. And of course, Paul also says, do you not know that you, y'all, all y'all, plural, 
you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. But also our individual bodies are temples. When we read Paul, he says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own? Most exciting of all, we come to the end times fulfillment of the idea of the temple, and that we find in Revelation 21, 22. John is having a vision of the holy city, the new Jerusalem, and he says, I saw no temple in it, it, this holy city, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. At last, we have the fulfillment of the meaning of the temple. Jesus is the temple. Jesus is the high priest officiating in the temple. Jesus is the sacrificial offering, the lamb that is offered in the temple by his work, in his sanctuary, and according to his priestly office. We have a new understanding of the temple, that it is himself. He is the temple. He is the meeting place. He is the meeting place where God and man touch and commune and fellowship. So when we read that Jesus was walking in the temple and it was the Feast of Dedication, what we read in John 10, that is no small thing. I want to kind of make a big deal out of it because when we see that he's walking in the temple, it reminds us of how God was walking in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day. And here we have a return to that, but, but a fulfillment of it. We rejoice that he is still wanting to be in our presence and wanting to be with us. But those of us who have had abortions, we wonder how in the world could I possibly make myself pure enough and holy enough to be in God's presence? How could I be a temple of the Holy Spirit? Is there anything that you can do to make yourself a worthy temple for the Lord? And the answer is yes and no. Yes, you can apply yourself to a greater level of dedication to God. Perhaps now is the time by your determination and your willingness to let go of defiling elements in your life. But the other answer is no, we can't do this ourselves. And we get a clue to this when we go back to the sanctuary in the wilderness. Let's go back to Exodus 29 and we read that God says, it shall be consecrated by my glory. He says, I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. I will consecrate Aaron and his sons to ministers, priests to me. I will dwell among the sons of Israel and be their God. So God does the consecrating. We are dedicated for service to the Lord by the sprinkling of his blood, the blood of the lamb, which purifies us and cleanses us from our unrighteousness such that we can be made pure by his power to devote ourselves and dedicate ourselves in service to him. So yes, you can do things, but you also need to let God do his thing. And his thing is that he is able to dedicate us and consecrate us, make us holy, sanctify us for his purposes. By the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. Thank you so much for joining us at Life After Choice. Like, share, and subscribe so we can grow our social media and internet presence and continue to minister to those who are hurt by abortion and anybody else who wants to listen. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.